thank you. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. So, um, if I had more time, I would have written you a shorter note. That, that's something that I remind myself of all the time, especially when I'm writing EIRs or a BIM email to somebody who's not BIM, or in particular, an asset register. And uh, I, I, you know, I regularly would write emails and then I take a couple of minutes and then reduce them all down. I'm, I'm a great believer that people can take five things, preferably three and ideally one. So um, this is, I think whenever it comes to reducing things, I think it takes more than just time. I think it takes courage, especially if you're a lonely BIM manager sometimes and you're trying to decide, do I really need that? Uh, and you need experience and I think you need knowledge. Um, so this presentation is about how SRC have been on a journey and how we try to ask for less because I think if you can get 100% rate at, at a small amount, you're going to be far better off than if you get 50% rate at a large amount. So I'll start off by you know who we are. We're, we're, we're one of six colleges in Northern Ireland. Um, we are in the, just over halfway through a uh, £100 million uh, programme of capital investment, and uh, we implement BIM across all of it. Um, we're in a very lucky position because when we're finished, we're going to have seven campuses, and we have now got models of all seven campuses. Um, one of them, I would say, is in a spatial concept stage, but it's still a model. Uh, the, we have two that were handed over in the middle of COVID. Uh, that's the top Armagh Band Bridge. We have three that are existing, where we've had to get existing asset information and models. And we have uh, one that is at stage three and one that's at stage one. So we've, we, we've now got experience as a, as a client across all seven RIBS stages. The one I'm going to focus on is the, is the college at Band Bridge, although we'll use some of the existing campuses as well through this presentation. We want to talk to you about some of the challenges, some of the benefits, and then more importantly to show you the thing, uh, you know, at the coal face, how it's working for us. Hopefully you'll be able to see it. I think some of these slides are starting to show through a wee bit. Um, the first thing is that our approach to BIM, and this is how we write the EIR, is we asked for three steps. And the first one is to list the information that you're going to give us. And, and that's the MIDP, but we, sometimes we don't even call it that. We just say list the information. And as a client, we give the team the MIDP to start with. So we'll say we want fire drones, but then once you've designed the building, you tell us how many. And that, I'll, I'll go into that in a wee bit more detail in a minute. We ask them then to deliver, and that's the CDE. And then we check that by monitoring. So effectively, what we're doing is we're comparing the MIDP against what's in the CDA. Uh, and um, we do that through dashboards. So if I look at, at uh, the first bit, when it comes to the MIDP, we apply the ISO, the geometry, the data, and the documents. But we've also added in activities. So from a geometry point of view, we see geometry as being the models, but we also see it as being the drawings. And we also ask for first and second fixed photographs of all rooms during construction. And I'll show you that in, in a minute, how that works for us. We also, ask, we also get virtual tours, and we ask for virtual tours as part of our, our deliverables. In terms of data, we, we follow Kobe, but we apply the, the fields and the structure of the Kobe. And then for documents, I, I would say that we would reference quite a bit with, with what Ryan has put up there in the Scottish Future Trust. And for activities, we're, we're looking at the moment at the ISO activities, but we would like to bring in the activity schedule from the scope of works under NEC. And one of the things we do as well is we, we actually have a task information delivery plan for the information manager, which I think sometimes gets forgotten about. So these things are all part of our deliverables. The, the CDE we see as being ours as a client, uh, and we see that we allow the uh, design team into that. Um, to do their design collaboration, but we're actually encouraging them to have their own platform, such as maybe BIM, Zoom Collab, et cetera. Um, we also encourage a separate contract administration platform. We have used CMAR in the past, and we found it very good. But we, do, we, we will work, and, 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 uh, and as I say, we allow the design team to uh, use S1, S2 in, in the common data, even though they're providing it. 
Um, but what we don't want anymore is the contractor in there all in for delivering the information. So if once we get the S4AN workflow set up, you know, that's, that's kind of key to it. Um, as regards the dashboards, we have in the past had very fancy dashboards that look very, very complicated. And if I'm being honest with you, nobody understood them. Um, and most people were too scared to say, I have no idea what that dashboard's telling me. Uh, so now what we have is a much more simplified one, but it does much more. It actually tells you, it's aimed for the project manager and it's a project dashboard. And it gives you an update on the files, or the documents. If we have 550, have 550 been delivered? Uh, it tells you about the data, which uses validation schedules coming from Revit. And then it looks at models. We have a very simple 15 questionnaire that we do for model compliance. We, we don't care how you answer the questions, whether you use Celebri or whatever, but uh, they're very simple questions. But we do ask for a screen print of the warnings in the models to show. And it's a wee bit like self-assessment tax. Uh, you know, you, it's up to you to tell the truth, but we will audit you every now and then to see that you're, that you're not making it up. Uh, and then finally, the activities for the ISO, we have those again on our, on our, the whole thing's on a RAG system. So if we see a red, we can drill in behind that and see. So for example, if we've started the next stage of the ISO and the previous stage hasn't been finished, that'll show up as a, as a, as a red. These are some of our challenges. I, I can't go into them in detail, but uh, we handed over two buildings in COVID. One particular one was handed over on the 18th of March 20, and on the 21st of March, Northern Ireland closed down, and we weren't allowed into it to even check or validate. So those are some of the challenges. We've had to renumber all of the spaces in our existing buildings because we use, you know, we're asking Ryan there, we use the uh, component name, and the component name is used. Uh, we use an FM code, which we found difficulty finding one because we were looking for a three digit. Um, and we wanted something that, as we would say, your granny would understand. So it's AHUs in our handling unit. Um, and we use the room number, so that's why we had to renumber all of our rooms in the existing campuses. And that ties in with timetabling and students, and students maybe with learning difficulties that understand a particular room uh, and the procurement of that. We've had also. Uh, um, I'll, don't don't mention Sharon is sitting in the audience here. Do not mention the word zip to her in terms of a common data. Uh, um, we've also had a Kobe. I'll just say it out loud, and I don't think we need to say much more than that. Um, but we do use Kobe. We use Kobe parameters. Uh, we use the structure of Kobe. We do find it very useful. But all of our information comes directly from the model up into the common data environment. We use Ecodomus. Um, so that's something. And Revit families. Uh, you know, we mentioned systems earlier on there. Uh, I, I think that's a whole science in itself. When you talk to a commissioning manager about systems, you talk to a designer about systems, and you talk to uh, a Revit designer, and then you talk to Autodesk about systems. I want, I want to put this up in terms of benefits. Uh, sometimes when we're looking at models, uh, you know, there's a sense that you navigate a model in 3D. We have found that a two-dimensional interactive floor plan to give you access to a 3D model is extremely useful. It's the way our BMS system works. It's the way our SE2000 access control works. And we would really like for our FM system to be much more like this. Um, this is a platform that we used at Arma that was provided by the team where they, where they created, uh, w our stakeholders could go in, click on a room, and then see a 3D model of it. This is an, an image, I'm hoping you'll see it there, but it's the Ecodomus, and in the center we have color-coded assets, so we have our maintained assets colored different from our non-maintained, and then we have our IT assets. On the left is the, uh, the room names, which are all uploaded directly from the model into, that, into the Ecodomus. And on the right is the component name at the top, and then the type name at the bottom, and then your documents. So I have to say, we have found it to be an excellent platform, and it really has helped our, it has been the catalyst to a cultural change within our, in a, within our department. Um, we now have a year of data uh, on, our, on our system with our new contractor because we switched over contractors a year ago and now we're able to go in and analyze that data and make intelligent, uh, good business decisions uh, based on cost, on efficiency and all of our KPIs. Um, I want to just talk briefly about the benefit of uh, our, our change because we've had a huge cultural change. We have an in a culture of innovation now. Um, we, we bring that through, we won the UK award for procurement innovation, and we also bring all of our uh, information and our learnings back into our curriculum. 
we run uh, collaboration courses. Not some of the other benefits we've had, unexpected uh, other awards, NEC Global Client of the Year. Um, but I think one of the big things has been the cultural change. We, we thought initially that this would be for managers. It's actually been the caretakers sometimes that have driven this uh, role and sometimes uh, ourselves. And then our stakeholder engagement again has been really much of a completely different quality than what it would be with drones. I, I want to show this image which is where we combine, so we've got our construction sequence, but we've mixed it with time lapse and with drone footage. And, and there's been a huge benefit about that, for example, for a, a project manor, manager signing off an accepted program under NEC4. Um, so we find that the combination of technologies works well, but it must be embedded in a process. We would have been able to watch this at the progress meeting and then look out the window and see if the construction sequence actually matches the program. Um, this particular image, if you can see it, is our, is our Bambridge project. And this here shows us the, the project with just the M&E assets. Just to be able to see all the M&E assets is, has been excellent for us. Down uh, on the bottom left, and I have it up here at the top left now, is our three boilers. And the three boilers over on the right, I know it's difficult to see here, but is our Ecodomus platform. So in that, what we're looking at is our historical information and our record information. Again, our data, our documents, and in that particular case with Ecodomus, our work orders. So that's our historical information. So we also then have our BMS, which is our live data. That's given us our temperature on the boiler. And in the, in the caretaker's office, they have three screens. They have the AC2000, which is your access control. They have the BMS, which is your live data. And then they've got their Ecodomus. And then on top of that, they've got their iPad. We also have our virtual tours now. So we can look at the models and look at the three boilers in the virtual tour. And we are currently adding, I know you can't see it here, in our meta tags. This is in Matterport. And we're now adding that in. And that has allowed us to be much more relaxed in, in what we get in a model and validation, because we know we've got the virtual tour. Um, I want to show you this, which is uh, our, our uh, virtual tours. And this is where we're able to now go in um, and uh, see that you can see the second fix and a uh, first fix. Uh, 360 photographs using the virtual tours. On top of that, we've got our uh, CCTV. So you've got your live footage alongside your second fix and first fix photographs. All that information all coming in. And then finally, you can look at the model as well in your iPad. So you can start in that space, or you can be the caretaker's office right beside it, and you'll see all this information from different uh, technologies and different times. Um, finally, where we're trying to move to now is taking all those technologies that we have that are kind of talking to one another a bit, but they're not fully linked. And what we're looking to do now with our digital twin, I know they're talking about this afternoon, is link them all together so that they're much more integrated. And that's where our sort of future lies. So hopefully that is a kind of a six years in 12 minutes presentation. Thank you very much. I'm sure we all found that very insightful. Now, I believe Peter's been excellent with his timekeeping. So as a result of it, Peter, can I please invite you onto stage to take some questions? Steve, over to you. So uh, any questions for Peter? Peter, thank you. A really excellent presentation there. Just one question. Updating your models at the minute, do you, as your building evolves or starts to evolve or somebody changes a window or a door, how do you capture that information in your 3Ds? Or do you capture it at this stage? Well, we, we had a, a good... Can you hear me okay? We, ha we actually had a slide showing that, but I had to take it out for time purposes. Um, it's It's... There's a process whereby we get, first of all, a compensation event through the NEC process. And then that compensation event will update our contract data, which is our data side. That then moves over into our asset register and the asset information model where it's updated. And then once that asset information is updated, that then updates the Revit information, which is then updated both the geometry and the, and the, and the data in Tekadomus. As part of a separate workflow, then the documents are being uploaded by the contractor in Tekadomus. 
So there's a sort of a closed night. So what you end up with is your, your documents and your data up to date in your NEC, up to date in your asset information, and up to date in your FM platform. So it's a kind of a very, and it's a, it's a workflow that involves the project manager under NEC4, the quality manager, Sharni's sitting there, and then it informs the, the BIM manager. So the BIM manager's nearly coming in, if you like, on, on the back of an NEC process. So NEC is extremely important to us. It, it, it structures a lot of what we do, and then, and then the BIM process sort of falls in behind that. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, Peter, uh, excellent presentation. Thank you, Andrew Jennings, uh, MCORM Architects. Um, in terms of your own role, role, your BIM change manager, how how does that, how did you come about to become the BIM change manager? Thank you. I, I don't know is the honest answer. <laughs> I'm not even sure what it is. Sometimes uh, my children get asked, what does your father do? And, and they still, I'm not sure I can ever tell them. Um, I have, I have a strange role because I'm involved with the new build projects, but I'm involved with the existing estate, and then I'm also involved with the curriculum. So there's, and the idea is that there's a transfer of knowledge between all three of those, and it actually works in both directions. So some of our courses we would have in other clients, and we would learn from them, and then that follows back in, and then some of the learnings we have from the projects. So, um, but I think somebody said it earlier on about having, Ryan was talking about having a BIM manager client side. I think, you ha I think it's vital. And, and I think I think you need a quality manager as well, and the two work together. And I think you need the project manager, the quality manager, and the BIM manager all working as a as a really tight team. Yeah, the the, the reason I asked that is because I'm obviously from the other um, from the other lectures there. They talk about systems analysis. You know that being one of the early things to be done for any organization. And I was just wondering, who do they look to within their organization to do systems analysis? You know? uh, well, uh, again, um, we had a slide up showing, we did an initial analysis of, of all of our systems, uh, right from our art collection we treated as a system, right through to our room booking, to our finance. And then we looked at the very early stage to see how that needed to talk to our asset information model. So we had one diagram that kind of showed that. If you like, that's now been substituted by the, the last image, which is where we, we have a much more unified approach. So, and, and in those days, we looked at to see was something either uh, copied and pasted, or was it hyperlinked, or was it maybe an API that was linking it up together? So we, we, we had a mapping process of how everything talked to one another within the college to start with, and that took quite a bit of time to to do, and it, but it, it did drive a lot of the decision making. A lot was in the background and nobody would have noticed it. When people came to you and said, what do you need? You were able to go back to that and say, well, I'm, I'm not gonna ask for that because uh, we'll, we'll do that. And we, we also do a lot on our side, especially when we're, when we're doing the existing buildings, we would say to them, look, don't you worry about, for example, the component name. It's too, it's too, it takes too long to explain that to them nearly for, for a surveyor that's not done BIM before maybe, and you're saying, don't you worry about the component name, just locate the assets in a room. And if you can do that, we'll do the component name fairly quickly at our side. I've got uh, one question online, which you probably take a look at then, now we've got time. So, question for Peter from uh, Sarah, um, technical manager at Swaco. Uh, what have been the key tangible benefits of being able to see first fix, second fix, as built and 360 photos? of the building post-construction? And how well, can that I'll, be sold? Yeah, I'll give paper? you an example. We wanted to move uh, a canopy, an extract canopy, um, and extend it uh, at one of our projects at Armagh. And we were able to uh, share a screen with the subcontractor who was going in to do that. And we were able to show him the uh, first and second fix photographs of the space where all the ductwork was going. We then showed them the model to show them where the ductwork was traveling within the model. And then we were able to also uh, talk that through with him. And, and uh, he said at the end of it that it saved him about one or two days work tracking through the building to try and find where everything had gone. Because they were obviously having to size up uh, uh, you know, load on the on the on the extract system, and they wanted to know could they extend it or put another bend in it, or what the implications were. And then we can give them the details on the fan that was on the roof. 
So, so that was one example that saved us a lot of time. But even uh, uh, the likes of um, the, the, the 360, the virtual tours, from a point of view of validating, because we're getting our existing uh, models in now, validating those, even the people building the models were able to use them. They have been an, an excellent resource. I would strongly recommend it for any client. Yeah, we'll, we'll dig into this a little bit more again this afternoon when we're talking about next stages and benefits and, and answering Sarah's question, how do you sell it? It's, it's quite tough for people to believe this until they've seen it. Really excellent. Uh, that's the general consensus online. Uh, really excellent presentation. Or, or partly seen it in this case. <laughs> <laughs> You can see it much better from the back than you can from the front. <laughs> well, for everyone in the audience, you can watch it again, yes, because it's all recorded. Right, Peter, thank you very much indeed. Okay. <laughs> Moving on to our next presenter, Grim, please take the stage.